The jails are the de facto mental asylums of the day. Uh, you know, deinstitutionalization began in the late 50s, early 60s. Well-meaning individuals did it, President Kennedy among them. We had an, these new drugs, uh, Thorazine, coming onto play, lithium coming into play. And so for the first time, people with serious mental illness were able to leave the asylums, and they were able to live outside the asylums. The asylums at the time were dreadful places for the most part. Um, where people were not getting care, and there were quite a number of scandals about them. In fact, Life magazine ran an article in 1946 with the title, Bevum. That's what the, that was what Life magazine called it. And it's actually about a mental hospital not that far from where I lived called Byberry, which was closed. So for well, from well-meaning individuals, and probably for the best of reasons, the institutions were, sh were closed and mentally ill people went out and hopefully President Kennedy said would be welcomed into the, what he called the welcoming arms and warmth of the community. Well, unfortunately that warmth never came and shortly when the, men the community mental health centers that he built never came and when President Reagan took over, uh, the money for the community mental health centers, the few of those that were built, dried up. So in essentially we did <laughs> this, we took people out of the asylums, put them onto the streets, and now put them into the jails. We made being mental illness a crime, and we treat them like criminals, and of course they become cycled in and out of the criminal justice system, exposed to all the things that happen, all the traumas that happen. Of course, poverty becomes a part of this cycle. Par poverty makes mental illness worse, and may even cause mental illness in some, uh, you know, in some way. So we've made the situation so much worse through deinstitutionalization. Um, bringing back the asylums is not an answer, but bringing back care surely is. Bethlehem was the first mental institution in the world. Started in Bethlehem, England, and was nicknamed Bedlam because that was just how people got to know of it. It is a name now synonymous with chaos and craziness, and I think in, it very much describes what's happening now in America that the mental, mental ill are on the streets, they're in the jails, they're part of a system that is utterly insane. They lack treatment, they lack research, they lack resources, so hence the name Bedlam. Uh, for me, this is a professional film and a personal film. It's a film, I have to say, I've always wanted to make and in some ways kind of dreaded making, frankly, because I never thought that I would share my personal story. In fact. Until I was 40 years old, I never told a soul that my sister was schizophrenic. I grew up in a time and a place when it was, I'm Jewish, it was called a shanda, the Yiddish word for shame. And I think that although I became a psychiatrist to help families like my sister, it took me many years to be prepared to share that story. Um, when I made this film, I made the film to show the tragedy and the trajectory of the seriously mental illness in America, particularly in Los Angeles, which is the epicenter of the crisis. But I also realized that the families didn't know why I was telling this story. The viewers didn't know why I was telling this story. And I needed to really be honest with them. And people like Patrice and her beautiful, kind brother, Monty, volunteered to be in this film to share their stories. So I thought at some point, a couple years into it, the least I could do is share my story. So when you watch the film, you know the person behind the camera as well as the people in front of the camera.